actually, I, I've got n- nothing on you in terms of your self description. Um, I, I keep it brief, but uh, who the fuck are you again? What do you do? <laughs> 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 and that might actually be the intro. Welcome back to the couple. Today, I'm joined by Mark Heineman. For all the listeners that compare, uh, sorry, that complain about my swearing, uh, apologies for the introduction. Um, Mark, you reached you reached out to me. Very fitting for me. <laughs> there you go. You reached out to me um, after this uh, most recent episode on uh, so-called peak shale with Lee Gehring. Um, that episode's got a lot of attention, a lot of views. Um, I found it personally interesting. Plays into my biases. We'll get into that later. Later. Um, but you uh, got in touch with me, had a really detailed uh, bit of feedback there. So uh, you've been sort of circling around there in the peripheries, people I wanted to get on the podcast. So good to have finally have you on, Mark. Uh, thanks for being here on Decouple. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Chris. Quick background. Yeah, who, who am I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the quick 10 second is a licensed professional engineer, uh, passionate about producing energy for America and the world. I've made a career out of that in the oil and gas sector, upstream oil and gas sector. Um, living in Colorado my whole life in the United States and uh, passionate about all forms of energy, but primarily those that are most energy dense. Uh, I think they're the best. And so I love oil and gas, but I love nuclear even more. So spend my days designing and supervising frack jobs and have spent a career um, working on kind of industrial grade projects uh, in the oil and gas space, but also grew up doing a lot of dirty jobs. Um, but now passionate about, you know, I spend kind of my nights and weekends advocating for nuclear energy and want to understand how we can build more. Yeah. I mean, I love having people on that are not from like the energy modeling world that have gotten their hands dirty in the past. I haven't had a ton of ONG people on, but, uh, you know, there's no uh, prohibition on (laughs) having people on that work in the sector. Uh, I've been very clear about, uh, you know, having a diverse array of guests and no kind of cancel culture bias. And we'll talk about, you know, the climate uh, issues and things like that. Um, But, you know, nuclear is quite limited in terms of, you know, new deployments, particularly in the West. Um, and obviously, uh, the fracking industry is active. It's doing stuff. There's there's things to be learned from the sector um, that uh, apply over to nuclear. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try and figure out to what degree they can be applied. Um, but yeah, just, just thrilled to have you on, man. So maybe uh, a good lead-in is just your reaction to uh, to our previous episode, uh, Peak Shale. Um, what's what's your take on, on what Lee Gehring had to share? Well, I, I'll say while I was listening to it, I agreed with probably 90% of his comments. Um, and I, I thought he did a great job characterizing a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of what oil and gas is, which was awesome. Um, and kind of given excellent history, but some things that stood out were, uh, well, let's start with, we can't do this elsewhere. Um, I agree that you know the shale revolution occurred in the United States, and I think that's primarily driven by property rights and people being able to gain and you know have financial incentives to go and try new stuff. Um, and that's you know somewhat unique to the United States. Um, I think that existed elsewhere, then that could be, um, it could be more common, but I, I don't think it's a question of geology. Um, and that's just because when I look at how the shales dif- differed from the Bakken to the DJ to the Eagleford to the Permian, and I had kind of a front row seat in my career watching those evolve, I've worked in each one of them, I've drilled wells in them and been a part of looking at, you know, what makes these wells productive, what makes them um, tick, what makes them, uh, how can we optimize them? And, you know, we watched this evolution uh, where we learned a lot, meaning the industry learned a ton. And by the time we got to the Permian, which is the best, it's by far the best, there's just so much resource there. Uh, we knew enough that it was really more of a manufacturing business, kind of like, you know, you start cutting down trees in a sparsely wooded area, and then you walk into a huge forest that you can uh, harvest a bunch of trees. Maybe that's a bad analogy, but it comes <laughs> <laughs> when people you get really uh, good at cutting down trees in innovative yeah. ways. <laughs> yeah, um, but you know that. And so when I think about what we learned over the past decade in the shale revolution, I find it challenging to believe that it can't be done elsewhere from a rock type and a geology. Uh, Availability, and if, if we took the know-how, the technology, the people, the human capital to other countries, we could absolutely do it. Right, right. I mean, it's it's interesting in a world in which AI is gaining increasing prominence. You know, there's this thinker uh, Noah Yuval Hariri, um, very well known for his book *Sapiens*. I love him. Yeah, and, yeah. He talks about kind of the 
you know, the human tendency universally to to have a kind of religious framework. Um, and what we worship are these sources of authority, whether it's priests that have, you know, in a very energy scarce society, if you want to be energy uh, determinist, you know, have uh, a higher level of education. So they're, you know, who the common people society puts trust in. And, and now, you know, algorithms are outperforming us. And that can be as simple as just the GPS system in your car. That's a bit of a meandering statement, but <clears throat> you know what uh, Lee was was claiming is you know they've developed this neural network that's been able to process a lot of data and crunch it. And again, I, I always have a you know it's a bias of mine, but a tendency to be suspicious of folks that are outside of getting their hands dirty and more in the modeling sector. Um, obviously, that's a bias, and I need to always be careful to, yeah. to challenge my biases. But what, what did you what did you think about that? Because that was I think, my re- my response the source to that, of a, I- the source of authority for what he was saying. You know, we've asked the AI and the AI told us. And I was like, oh. <laughs> my, my response to that is, I mean, we use AI models in our planning and development and look backs. We're using one right now to plan some of our new development. And I mean, I'm integral in that process and devising a strategy of how many wells do we drill? Which zones do we target? Geologic zones do we target? Um, and the, the challenge with a lot of models is that if you don't have a lot of data points on either ends or in the bounds, um, then they can, you know, triangulate to where the group think has um, been for a long time. Um, and so that's true with humans, and that's true with AI models too. So, and I love your analogy of the prophets. Uh, I'll say historically, geologists have been uh, the prophets in the oil and gas industry. You know, they say, go drill here. And I say that affectionately, meaning my dad was a geologist. He spent his career wildcatting, um, going drilling wells all over the place, North Dakota and Eastern Colorado, um, had his own company. But what I've come to learn in the past, especially with shale, is many of the conventional beliefs that were held um, by geologists and you know where to find oil, how to find oil, are just not true. Meaning, for whatever reason, when we use this technology and these techniques, some of the rules of thumb don't apply. And one example that Garing gave was clay content. Um, you know, if there's a high clay content, lots of water in the clay, you know, your fracking technique may not work. That's 100% not true. <laughs> we have evidence of wells that we've drilled that have high clay content. And they are uh, barn burner wells, meaning they, they're very, very productive, very prolific. So, um, yeah, that comes to mind. And just thinking, again, the international question. So my, my context for this, I, it's been fascinating to see how America has uh, pulled ahead in the space and the rest of the world seemingly hasn't caught up or paid attention, which um, my... Story behind this is in 2019, I was accepted to go and speak at a conference in Monaco, which was awesome, very, very lucky opportunity. But it was a global conference, oil, oil and gas conference, hosted by Schlumberger, uh, back when they were still called Schlumberger. So that's the largest oil and gas service provider in the world. Um, I, folks from the U.S. were the only ones there that were talking about shale and unconventionals. And this was, you know, three, four years ago. Um, everyone else in the world was still focused on old technologies, vertical wells, and you know, they were doing awesome things and producing a lot of oil, but they just hadn't looked at any of the new, new technologies. And so when I talked to people and say, well, have you guys thought about horizontal drilling? And have you worked with your geologist on it and done mapping and any of the seismic and looked at you know, how they can be more productive? And the, the general answer was, well, we're kind of ignorant about that. And we don't really understand it. We, you know, and we'd love to learn. And so people would come to the um, U.S. booths and try and learn about it. And, you know, the vendors that were selling the technology there would educate people. Um, And the strangest thing to me, which now in hindsight doesn't seem so strange, but at the time I was apparently ignorant of geopolitics, was any of the unconventional plays or areas in the conference, uh, there was one country that wasn't allowed to uh, go and uh, look at the technology, which was Russia. (laughs) They literally had it locked off and, you know, checked everyone's badges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to show your badge and show your country and like to get into the unconventional area, which I was like, what? I thought the Cold War was over. What? Why is wow. this still happening? You know? And so right. that was a very interesting learning. But anyway. Damn, that's fascinating. Okay, so <clears throat> I think the way I want to take this is to interrogate again the peak oil thesis. You know, are we there? Did we get there in 2018? Uh, because it's very relevant to, to, again, one of the other biases that I hold. Um, you know, shale revolution, pretty miraculous, unlocked a ton of energy, had a bunch of economic benefits um, and I guess climate benefits in terms of helping to swap out coal. Um, but in terms of my thesis of, you know, what gets nuclear deployed and what spurs innovation, whether it's technological, but probably more importantly, regulatory, 
is pragmatic issues of energy security and fossil fuel constraints. So if you look at, you know, other than the US, you know, which was a real pioneer in the technology and maybe had other motivations, atoms for peace or whatever for their deployment. Although I understand coal got pretty expensive in the early days. So nuclear actually was financially attractive. But in, in a lot of other areas, in my country, for instance, you know, where the nuclear got built in Ontario, we didn't have, you know, and it's the French line, like, we do not have oil, but we have ideas. Um, so Ontario, France, you know, Japan, you know, that burned up most of its coal in its rapid industrialization period, you know, South Korea, that's a functional island, um, and doesn't have a lot of endogenous fossil fuel reserves. You know, even China, um, they have lots of coal, but not in the in the southern coast where the population bases are. So this is what drives nuclear deployment. Um, and, you know, we make the regulatory changes. Like, I have no doubt if the U.S. was fossil fuel constrained, like nuclear is the best swap in. It's not perfect. Like ONG still still is the most, you know, uh, ver- I don't need to explain this to you, obviously, but just, you know, my just the listeners, the most versatile uh, form of energy that we have. We live in a fossil fuel civilization. But if you ain't got it. Nuclear is your second best to fulfill, you know, at least a lot of the stationary roles, certainly electricity production, maybe some process heat stuff, if, if we allow it. But, you know, the motivation uh, to change the regulations um, and to fund and deploy fundamentally seems to be energy scarcity. So that's why I'm personally, you know, in a kind of doomer way being like, oh, hopefully peak oil is here, despite knowing that it's going to be like hell for civilization. Um, so there's my biases. Your thoughts about peak oil, I mean, I, I'm guessing you're going to say it is inevitable at a certain point, but timing is is everything in terms of planning. What's what's your take? Uh, so I, I may be too deep in the forest to, or to, too, too deep in the trees to see the forest, right? Uh, meaning my exposure currently is in the Permian Basin. We're looking at how many more wells can we drill on our existing assets? How much inventory do we have? And... It, you know, it's it's not infinite. The the shale wells are, are not infinite. Um, there there is a limit for how many you can drill, and there's a limit to how many zones and how productive they'll be. Um, but something that is radically true is supply and demand is always there. And so, I I think it's what it, what is peak oil at what price is probably maybe a better question. And how much do people really want that raw material? Um, from an energy perspective. You know, I, I think it'd be awesome if we transitioned to nuclear tomorrow and stopped lighting the stuff on fire. <laughs> it would be really helpful. Um, but we, we still use the raw material for, to drive our industrial society. Um, and until we have a feedstock replacement, which we could do with abundant nuclear, um, you know, an abundant cheap energy, you could change the feedstock of crude oil to just be air and water. Um, but until we do, then it's, this stuff is super valuable still. Um, and so if, if you're asking me to uh, put a date on peak oil, um, everyone's always wrong, but I'd say there's another five to 10 years of opportunity for growth just from the Permian Basin alone. And maybe not growth. I, I don't think you know, the U.S. peaked at 12.8 million barrels a day. Um, I don't think we'll get much above that, but I wouldn't be surprised if prices hold above $70, $80, $90 a barrel. Um, we maintain that production level for the next uh, two to five years if not increase it up to 13 or 14 million barrels a day. But remember, there, I, I tell people this a lot, there's not a lot of differential in the global supply-demand curve for oil, uh, right? It's, oh, it's 1% to 2% spread, so 100 million barrels a day. Um, the U.S. is doing 12 to 13 million barrels. If we go up to 13, 14 million barrels, then that totally flips the, the supply amount, you know, and, and throws the market upside down and then it's not as valuable anymore and people have to use it and then there's a recovery period. So, um, but as far as just inventory in the U S um, I, I do think we'll run out of core tier inventory in the next five to 10 years in the Permian basin, but there's going to be, it's, that's a lot. It's, it's a ton. And for, to, to add on your question of, well, does that help deploy nuclear and how do we deploy nuclear faster? Um, I, I agree with you that, you know, there's this national security piece, that's important to think about, and it's a big driver for a lot of countries right now. But really, it's more of an energy security. How do we have energy that's dependable? And that's very important. Um, but then I, I always say incentives drive the world. And if it's profitable for somebody to build nuclear, then they'll build it, um, which I think regulations are a huge hindrance of that. But I think the industry itself also has been a huge hindrance. Um, you know, the kind of there's, We can get into detail about that and some ideas on that. But and how I compare it back to oil and gas. But one, one thing that came to mind immediately before our call was, you know, shale wells, 
cost anywhere between, call it five and $15 million a piece to drill. And when oil was, you know, 50, 60 bucks, um, some of them in the Eagleford in Texas um, weren't economic. Um, but many in the Permian Basin now are still economic at $15 million a piece, right? So you can invest, we'll just say 10 million bucks into some of these wells. And within three years, you've made five to six times that back. I don't really know of another industrial grade project <laughs> that you can invest 10 million bucks over and over and over again and uh, within three years, uh, double, triple, or 5x your money. And so if that opportunity existed in the nuclear space, which I think it should, and the physics support it, and I 100% support it, and I want to change this about the industry, is how do we get out of our own way and leverage this fuel and this technology to actually realize even better returns than what we can do with oil and gas? Right, so yeah. That was peak oil to, uh, yeah, how do, how do we yeah. build more nuclear? We can dive in on any of those. But. For sure, for sure. Yeah, again, I, I hold fast to this thesis that without a, a pragmatic energy shortage reason, the regs won't get changed. And you, as you mentioned, it's multifactorial, but the regs, regulations are just such a huge part of what what holds back nuclear, I whether agree. it's in these kind of micro... Way harder than oil and gas. <laughs> huge, right? Huge. Yeah. Okay. And irrationally um, so. They shouldn't be more strict. It's a safer technology, in my opinion. Right, right. Right. Okay, so I'm, I'm learning a lot about oil and gas, or actually I'm learning a little about oil and gas, I'll be honest there, uh, starting from nothing. Um, so we've had a few guests. Um, we had B.F. Randall on um, talking about diesel and, and diesel engine as the pump and diesel fuel as the lifeblood of civilization, running all of our kind of heavy uh, machines, so vital to transport, mining, et cetera. Um, that really brought that uh, you know, into my, uh, my awareness. Um, and then I've heard this thesis, and I want to double check with you, um, that, you know, Certainly, the U.S. is importing a lot of heavy oil, and the refining um, industry is built up around that oil. So, you know, it's more complicated than saying that the U.S. is now kind of energy pen- dependent when it, independent when it comes to oil. Um, but, you know, the things I've heard is that we're quite short on diesel. I don't know if there's a strategic diesel reserve, but I've heard numbers like we have 30 days of diesel in the U.S. Um, that's a concern if it is the lifeblood. So the, the question is, does fracking produce like a lighter, sweeter oil that is going to have less of that mid distillate? Are we going to end up like, what, what about like peak mid distillate, you know, beyond, beyond <laughs> peak oil? Cause even we had, uh, all right, yeah. not, we had, but I've, I've talked with, uh, you know, uh, Art Behrman about this, but saying, you know, what we call oil is, you know, it used to be kind of 90, hundred percent was actually crude oil. And now 40% are natural gas liquid or sorry, like 40% are, you know, the majority of natural gas, liquids, ethanol, other things, but yeah, let's let's zone in on that question. Um, are we kind of going to hit peak mid distillates, which again drive you know heating oil, diesel, jet fuel, etc.? I, I I wish I had a better answer for you on this, Chris. So I'll I'll be able to provide my perspective, which is mostly upstream and midstream, and um, and and some exposure to downstream. Um, but the you bring up a good point, right? What is this distillate? What's the difference between crude oil and natural gas? It's all hydrocarbons. It's just a matter of how many carbons are in the chain. And yeah, the the oil that's produced out of shale wells is typically lighter hydrocarbons, meaning fewer carbons in the chain because uh, it's easier to get them through the small cracks that we generate when we fracture rocks. And that's the predominant reason for why, why that exists. Um, you, you can still use it as a feedstock in, in some refineries to, to make you know, your, your different products, but yeah, diesel is a heavier product. Um, it has more carbons, right? And so you're going to need to have the heavier crude available for it. And I've seen certainly the diesel shortage re- reflective in the pricing of diesel for our operations. It's, it's very expensive, <laughs> very expensive to frack fuels, one of our highest cost items. Um, it, I don't know that that gets transformed or reversed. So uh, just, I totally agree with you that diesel is the lifeblood for industry and because it's the most easy to distribute you know there's millions of engines that have been deployed globally uh, to use it and I, I don't know if there'll be a, a flip on it but I suspect that the economics will drive you know if, if people keep buying it and they will um, it'll be more expensive to import then we'll have to import it from elsewhere um, and the the spread on it you know refineries will still have to import fuels to, to be able to distill it and and create it um, and I think the downstream effect of that is the diesel price remains high, um, which I think for nuclear is a good thing, um, particularly for micro reactors and uh, being able to deploy micro reactors 
uh, to displace some of these diesel engines. Um, so th think about what is the lowest hanging fruit for energy replacement? It's diesel generators. And how, what, what stands a chance to displace diesel generators? Well, only a more energy dense fuel. So, okay, maybe you could replace it with natural gas. That, that you certainly can actually, that's happening all the time. We're doing that in industry. Um, but that, that has its own supply chain uh, hurdles. But yeah, cost displacing diesel first is probably your best option. Yeah, I mean, so interesting anecdote from my backyard. We have a territory in the far north, I believe like 15 to 20,000 people um, heavily dependent on heating oil and diesel. Um, and, you know, when, when fossil fuel prices got expensive early 2000s, you know, they were spending more than a quarter billion um, <laughs> on their energy needs. So, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about the uh, possibility of micro modular. And obviously, you, you know, can't build natural gas infrastructure to serve tiny communities. So, you know, an aside, but I think an interesting one in terms of a niche application. So, Mark, we've, as I said, we've, we've had some, I think, good descriptions, um, certainly at the natural gas masterclass with Mark Nelson, um, which was more, I guess, downstream. Um, I think Lee Gehring did a great job of, of describing, um, you know, the, the, the kind of theories around fracking and, and, you know, how the technology works. But what I love about having a guy like you on is that you can give us this kind of visualization of what it actually looks like. Um, and what I'm, what I'm really interested in is just how it's unique or different versus traditional um, oil and gas. And you've talked about drilling horizontal wells, but really from the perspective of kind of what it looks like, like what does a landscape dotted with these wells look like? Um, what are the pragmatics of it? You said like a lot of, and you got to put a lot of energy into, you know, bust these fractures through the rock. So maybe you can kind of take it from there to, to talk about those yeah, differences. Yeah, I can, we'll get can that get side of high, high level overview for the listeners. Well, and I love Gehring's question, you know, it's, it's complicated and so we can't export it. Uh, you know, we, th we think about who's making all this happen. And I involuntarily almost said out loud when I listened to that, I was like, well, we are. <laughs> right, <laughs> like right. The, the, the engineers and most importantly, the, the guys on the ground, boots on the ground guys that are actually, you know, turning wrenches and driving, driving trucks and, and, you know, piecing all of the steel together to actually make it happen. Um, so in, in the industry, there's kind of, we, we think of the, We'll say well construction process, and oil and gas development process. We bifurcate it into several different sectors, and we just call it what it is. It's drilling, uh, completions, which is synonymous with fracking, uh, facilities, and then production. And those are kind of the four pillars of operation, operational activity for upstream oil and gas. So in conventional plays, drilling is very similar. It's almost the same. We just use different tools, but it's this huge drilling rig, which can be. Um, I'll, I'll characterize these different phases of uh, the, the life cycle of oil and gas in, in terms of, we'll call it semi-trucks, right? So oil and gas operations happen in the middle of nowhere um, where the oil and gas is. Often it's not where people are. And so we have to transport all of the equipment to location to actually you know, build mini industrial sites for a short amount of time. Um, rig up, it's a very common term in the industry, but literally rig up all the heavy equipment and tie it all together and then, you know, use it for its purpose and then rig it down uh, seven to 30 days later and, and take it out of there. So a drilling rig might have uh, 60 semi trucks worth of equipment that are toted to, to location. And then they piece it all together like a jigsaw puzzle and have a whole you know, mud pump installation system and plumbing system that's fascinating. It, so I studied mechanical engineering and the first time I was on site with the drilling rig, I was like, Dee? These are huge toys. <laughs> this right, is right. incredible. Like, look at all this equipment. And very um, modular, and right? Like very you know, modular, incredibly mm -hmm. modular. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you Google a picture of a drilling rig, many people think of drilling rigs as fracking towers, and that's a misnomer in the industry. We don't use drilling rigs to frack at all. We use them to construct the well bore to give us the opportunity to frack, but we don't use that same equipment. So um, drilling and drilling a well could take anywhere from you know three days to the two months, you know, if, if things go poorly. Um, and most of that equipment people are paid by the day. So you want to drill wells as fast as possible. Um, but once, once the well's drilled and constructed, so, they, you know, they drill a hole in the ground, then they install pipe and you pump cement around the pipe that creates a pressure barrier and prevents fluids from moving up hole into the surface groundwater. Um, and then you rig down all this equipment, take it away, and then come back with a frack fleet. Um, and so that's, what, what is a frack fleet? Uh, that's about 20 to 30 additional pickup trucks uh, or semi trucks that have heavy equipment on them. Um, you'll have typically 15 to 20 pumps. So these are literally 
uh, triplex pumps that will compress fluids, compress water into high pressure. Um, they're all in, in a line um, and they're all plumbed together in parallel and plumbed into the one single line that goes to the well bore and then can pump down um, a ton of water all at once. Um, upstream of the pumps, you'll have what they call a blender um, that you know, brings together all of the material that you're going to put into the slurry stream, which is really just water and sand, but we throw some chemicals in there too to help with the process. Um, mostly friction reducer, which is a polymer that will reduce the amount of friction as you pump this water down into the well. It's, it's a phenomenal chemical, and if anyone's interested in chemistry, it's a fascinating to study. Um, but then upstream of the blender, you've got all of the sand. And so where does the sand come from? And it's a ton of sand, like 12,000 tons of sand per well. <laughs> so, like, think, yeah. Uh, and uh, there might be uh, 40 tons of sand, 40 to 60 tons of sand per truck that shows up, and all the sand's trucked in. Right, they get it from sand mines, typically in basin, but and they'll, they'll, they'll truck it 30 to 100 miles to location. And so there's just this constant stream of trucks going in and out of location while you're fracking, right? And you've got, you know, your water source that um, brings in water from uh, either nearby water wells or recycled water that you've produced from other oil and gas wells. And so you have to stage that also. Um, but you bring all of this equipment together, and typically there's like 10 to 30 people running around. Um, the whole operation, making sure that, you know, all of the pumps are rigged up in line and nothing's leaking and they're operating the equipment. And then for one well, it typically takes like five to 10 days. I use seven days as a good metric, but to, to frack, um, you know, and, and during that time, you're just pumping as, as continuously as possible water and sand into the ground um, to fracture rocks. Um, the... Fun part about this that I think of, and, and the parallel that I draw to nuclear, is in seven days, think about this, Chris, we pump and dispose of 12,000 tons of solid material into the subsurface that is then virtually gone forever. Meaning when, you know, when, when we turn the well back on, we might get some sand back. There might be some sand that's carried to surface, but it's a trivial amount, maybe several hundred pounds of 12,000 tons, you know, that we pump in. Um, think about, so we've, we've virtually removed that sand from the biosphere, and now it's in the subsurface in a geologic formation that has been there for millennia, right? This oil was there from 70 million years ago when the Permian Basin was formed. We expect to never see it again. Can you think of another application that might be useful to uh, use that in? You know, or is there another... There's another material that we have that we might want to like, dispose of and and like be arguing about how we're going to do it presently. <laughs> I mean, uh, deep isolation. Like, I, I can't imagine yeah. like powdering up nuclear waste and using it instead of sand. But is that what, is that what you're true. getting at, or am I way out? Of yeah. Well, no. I'm, I'm just you know. We're just I, talking I, I, about I'm, storing. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, so right. It's we, we're we're doing this every day in the oil and gas industry, and yeah, it's different right. different grades of material, right? But gotcha. And and so, but think about how much waste there is. So in the U.S., you could say there's about 100,000 tons, 90 to 100,000 tons of waste, and we dispose of 12,000 tons in a week in the per well in the subsurface. So when people talk about waste, I'm like, guys, this is not a problem. Of course, <laughs> of course it's not. Just the sheer amount of material versus how much material we're moving in, in the oil and gas industry to get a minuscule amount of energy. Like, right, yeah. right. So speak, anyway. speaking of that energy, so a couple of things uh, as well. Like the lifespan of the well, I think, is interesting. Um, like, is the landscape dotted with like well after well? Is it more of a visible so that's form of the advantage, energy? That's a big advantage for horizontal drilling. Yeah, the, the right. industry touts okay. all the time. Is, you know, and in the old days, you have, had to have these checkered spots of you know, and go and infill drill and have one vertical well bore to drain a radial area. And with the horizontal wells, you can drain more area and have less of a surface footprint. That's awesome. It's, it's absolutely good. Um, but we're still scraping fresh surface and fresh earth that wasn't disturbed before to access some of these plays. And that's one thing that, you know, it is bothersome to me with a land use perspective that I, I think nuclear is even better than oil and gas. And I love nuclear for that. When I fly over oil and gas plays, or when you look at them from satellite views, you can see where this has happened. You can see all the pipeline scarring and the well pads, and like that stuff doesn't go away. I mean, you can re reclaim it, but the scarring is going to be there for several generations to come. Um, 
you know, so there's this, this disturbance of the surface that we're doing in oil and gas that, I mean, yes, we're disturbing less with horizontal wells, but it's still happening. Versus if we use nuclear, then. Okay. Second question. Um, you know, this energy returned and energy invested, I think it's always fascinating to think about what is the quality of the energy invested. And so when we have wind and solar, we end up inputting a ton of really, you know, high quality energy in the form of thermal coal for the metallurgy, um, you know, coal to, to make the polysilicon, uh, other, other fossil fuels. Um, and what comes out the other end, the energy returned is, I won't say it's useless, but it's this kind of spasmodic electrons only and not necessarily when you need them and lots of curtailment. Um, so in terms of the energy in for fracking, how much, like how big is the, the, the diesel generation? Um, is it a measure? I mean, everything can be measured in kilowatt hours, I guess, but what's the size of that power plant? You know, I, we were hearing about copper mines having like a 30 uh, megawatts uh, power plant to run the crushing and everything else. So how, how does how does fracking compare in terms of yeah, the, so some the energy easy numbers? And, yeah, some easy numbers to, to think about. Um, for, for the fracking process and to frack wells, that is the majority of the energy used uh, in the process. Now, to drill wells, you know, the, the de- uh, drilling rig is run on diesel, but they use about 1,200 gallons of diesel a day. And again, if it takes a month to to drill a well, then that's about 30,000 gallons of diesel. Um, after the f- fracking process, um, for the life of the well, there can be a large power demand um, for what's called artificial lift. Um, so to aid, if, once the reservoir is initially pressured up from the fracturing process, it will flow naturally for uh, a month to a year. But after, after that, um, you, know, you want to produce this well for another 30, 40 years to get more hydrocarbons out of it. Um, there's what we call artificial lift, and there's, I mean, this is one of the pillars of oil and gas uh, uh, engineering is production engineering. They've developed a myriad of technologies to um, use for to aid in artificial lift. Um, what and one of those sucking suck on the straw basically is that sucking on the straw, yeah. And, and they all have a different power in versus power out demand, and you kind of go from the most power intensive at the beginning of the life of the well because it's worth it. You get more out and then kind of reduce your power intensity over time and use the least power intensive one over time. So, um, but, and that's a permanent installation, which is helpful. You can have line power, you can build grid power to location for that. But oftentimes it's expensive for long term, or you know, your power demand decreases over time because it decreases over time. Having a remote installation like a diesel generator or a micronuclear reactor on site or off site to power that operation could be really helpful. But that's kind of on the order of call it half a megawatt down to you know 100 kilowatts um, that for that long-term power demand need per well. Um, but during the fracturing operation, it's your power demand is between 20 and 30 megawatts of power. And think about how much energy that is. Remember, power is uh, energy per time, and you're not there for very long. You're only there for seven days. Uh, to frack one well. So in seven days, it's never going to be economic to build line power to each location and frack them, which is why we use diesel and natural gas that's portable. Um, You know, we'll compress the natural gas uh, and we'll bring the diesel out in trucks and uh, we can burn it in the same engine. Um, But how much do we use then? A number that's helpful for listeners is uh, and for one well, about 150,000 gallons of diesel per well. Um, and so when you think about energy return on energy invested, dollars is often a good proxy for this. Um, it, it's not always and certainly not in the case for nuclear. Uh, but for oil and gas operations, like I said, you could have a uh, you know, well that pays back in, call it three years, that you get your money back in two to you know, two to six X your money. Um, and of that $10 million, the diesel cost currently is about $700,000. So, um, but you're making a multiple. So you're putting that much energy in, you know, which would be seven, 10%, but then making a multiple of two to six X on the total return. So that's why the numbers, you know, for hydrocarbons, it's more energy return on energy invested is people say it's like 30, right? Uh, 30 units in to, uh, or for every unit in, you get 30 out, which kind of makes sense, right? 150,000 gallons of diesel in, and then how much oil are you actually getting out of that? That's then useful later, right? So those numbers kind of kind of make sense. And if you sat down and did the math, I think you'd 
get get pretty close. Well, and you, I mean, the, the key thing here in terms of the quality of the energy in versus the energy out is that you know a, a, a wind turbine can't create the energy that can reproduce itself, and yep. oil and gas can. Yeah, yeah. that's fundamental staple. Yeah. It's, it's basic, right? But it's something that's overlooked. I mean, there's <laughs> lots lot. of lots of people energy absurdities. People, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's move on a little bit to, you know, again, we talked about, you know, the fracking industry, the oil and gas industry being dynamic, innovative, having problems, solving them, you know, having probably minimal regulation, certainly when compared to nuclear. I'm sure there's a bunch of regulation there, but I mean, <laughs> no doubt that it's less than nuclear. So in, in a perfect world where there was sensible regulation for nuclear, what kind of lessons could the fracking revolution lend to to nuclear to nuclear innovation to nuclear deployment in your opinion um what, what the first one that comes to mind is this idea between you know collaborating versus competing um and so in in the oil and gas sector the shale revolution happened um and it took a decade and billions of dollars invested to make it happen but it happened because people learned over and over again about how to drill wells better and produce them better and there were lots of people in the industry that, you know, developed secrets or had, um, and th this still happens, right? Where they'll go and try and buy up a bunch of leases and develop a land position because that's valuable. Again, it's the property rights that's really valuable, that that gives them the chance to sell uh, the, the energy. Um, but once they had the recipe, the technology uh, was just iterated and improved on. And this happens still where, and, and because you'll have these third-party technology vendors that are trying to sell to the energy developer their technology. And so they're working with every energy developer to try and make their stuff better. Um, and there, there's really, at its core, a, a lot of intrinsic collaboration that happens in the oil and gas industry, meaning all of the production data is public. There's no secrets about how much oil came out of each hole in the ground. Um, there's Now, in some states, they, they can have a uh, what they call tight hole period, where they'll you know spend six to twelve months um, tight holing the production data to give you know anyone that risked their capital first, they have a chance then to go out and drill more wells or buy more land around it to try and give them a competitive advantage. But after that tight hole period, it becomes public and everyone can see how productive that well was. What else is public is the design that they used to actually frack the well. <laughs> And so that's why we learned over time how to make these things better and how to do it more effectively. Um, I draw that parallel to the nuclear industry. And that, I mean, yeah, there's ANS conferences and people are talking about different technologies that they're using. But all that I see in the nuclear industry is people trying to build drilling rigs and not people going out and actually selling energy. Meaning there's, there's a missing piece in the developer space um, there's a missing piece in the collaboration space. There's a missing piece in the supply de demand, the who the actual customers are, who they can be. Um, and and there's a huge missing piece in kind of project management. Um, you know, it, it feels like there's a lot of uh, OEMs, original equipment manufacturers that exist, and not a lot of energy developers. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly we hear this phrase, there's no natural constituency for nuclear, or there is no nuclear industry. Partially because we're not building anything, um, you know, and, and partially because, again, they're not actually in the business of selling the electrons. It's the utilities and the utilities, you know, aren't particularly committed to nuclear if it's less economic than, say, gas. Um, so that that certainly rings true for me. Um, <clears throat> in the interest of time, like, you know, I was, was going to ask kind of, you know, what, what else is kind of holding nuclear back? But I think in the interest of time um, and just drilling in on your expertise, um, interested in moving along a little bit. Um, so... We talked a little bit about regulation holding things back. Um, it'd be interesting to hear, sort of, you know, having studied both on your on your side of things, you know, how oil and gas regulation compares to uh, to you know nuclear and NRC type regulation. Um, whether you feel like you know whether you feel like the limitations of nuclear can be overcome with the existing uh, maybe that's a leading question, right? But the existing regulations in place. Your thoughts on on nuclear regulation? Uh, in short, no, uh, it's a disaster. So. When you think about why, why is nuclear more expensive to build uh, if the energy in versus energy out is better? And my take is uh, there's just so much other energy that goes into all of the paperwork and regulation uh, behind it <laughs> that right. is feeding humans <laughs> and doing studies right. and like taking up more time that's literally adding energy to the system in, you know, and you're getting less out. 
right? So like, if we just what, clean slated it and said, hey, go build that, uh, and if you kill someone, then we're going to sue you, <laughs> then and, and you'll be held responsible like every other industrial activity that exists generally, right? I mean, that this is like a change in mindset of asking for forgiveness versus asking for permission. Uh, the nuclear industry is one of the only ones that not only asks for permission, but actively looks around at uh, you know, how they're not gated off and how they're not safe enough and tries to make it even more onerous to do their job. Um, which I think that's a misalignment of incentives. I mean, I agree with Kugelmass almost 100% on this with his view of it. Um, and that's coming from, um, you know, one of my mentors is a nuclear safety engineer and has spent her career uh, selling safety <laughs> and safety upgrades. And she, she agrees. It's like, yeah, there's this perverse incentive in the industry. So, yeah. No, uh, so sure. how, do we, how do we fix that then? Um, I think having a dual mandate with the regulator and specifically the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to change that institution to say, not only are we going to protect, but we're also going to promote and do a cost-benefit analysis of how good is this compared to other energy technologies and other solutions. And if we can get this built faster, then can we go easy on some of the regulations? I, I think that's, that's the solution in my mind currently. Because um, I, I don't think all of the regulations now actually make it safer. <laughs> okay, another another question that just popped to mind. Um, certainly, Rod Adams is big on you know this. I won't call it a conspiracy theory, but you know the Rockefellers' role in trying to suppress nuclear energy by you know funding Herman Mueller, the Beer reports, um, and this idea again of the linear no threshold hypothesis. That's kind of far in the past. Um, there's probably more recent examples of some campaigns against nuclear plants opening that were funded by the coal industry. To what degree is nuclear held back by not just the competition from fossil fuels in terms of cheap, available, abundant natural gas, for instance, but anything kind of lurking behind the scenes? Or is nuclear just like just such an irrelevant threat to the business model? Yeah. Yeah. They're their own worst enemy. Don't understand the business model. And I want to change that. But I also the stigma that there's um, a shadowy oil and gas executive or we'll say the industry as a whole thinks that we need to hold nuclear down or hold them back. Um, to, to save our assets and make our assets main, maintain value um, is much more conspiracy theorist than I, I think a lot of people will give it credit for. Um, now, there's certainly been examples, like you said, the Rockefellers that are funding stuff. Um, but from my own exposure, and I've written articles on this, that I, every time that I talk to someone in oil and gas, they're all for nuclear. Um, and we're trying to change that stigma. There, there's a gentleman in Denver and I uh, that have written kind of an open letter and we're working on getting signatures now, but from oil and gas executives endorsing nuclear as a technology and advocating to um, the U.S. and the world that we use more of it. Yeah, is this just charitable or what's in their interest uh, to promote nuclear? I mean, I, you know, I've always been well, puzzled. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go most, on. People in, most people in oil and gas, I, I mean, are in the business because they like energy. They like technology. They um, you know, they, they like, and also making money, right? That's fantastic. And if they could make money doing nuclear, then they would. And they're pragmatic and highly technical and understand the cost benefits behind everything. And so if, if there were an industry to invest in and they could make as much money doing it, then I, I think many of these energy companies 100% would. So we, we've talked a little bit about, you know, some niche roles. I mean, it, it does seem like a maybe not a great value proposition to, you know, bring a micromodular reactor in for that first week of the the drill in the frack where it's very energy intensive. But, you know, in terms of refining, um, I disagree. I that, I'd want to put okay. a micro reactor on every drill and frack site. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I'm not, I, I guess it depends on whether you need to bring in like a nuclear engineer to like operate it, et cetera. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that aside. But in terms, I mean, X energy has signed deals with uh, Dow chemical to, you know, provide process heat with nuclear. I guess that's a potential synergy um, of of nuclear and and the traditional energy sectors. I'm just trying to rack my brain here to to again. I love challenging my biases. Let's let's pivot um, to climate and climate concern. Um, there's a new term out now called climate solution denialism. So if you're critical of renewables, you know we found another way to to slag you and and label the the denier uh, label on. So you know I. I very early in the podcast, I had to make a decision about, you know, especially, you know, I'm still very climate concerned, but, you know, there's a kind of taboo on the left amongst progressives, amongst the climate 
you know, I shouldn't be talking to you, Mark, because you're an evil guy with, you know, oil stains on your hand, blah, 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 blah. I quickly rejected that uh, because I find people within energy, maybe people on the political right, have more engineering discipline, understand how the sausage gets made, and I want to understand how the sausage gets made. Um, and, and I think some of the, um, I think most people nowadays recognize that human beings are having an impact on the climate, that you know global warming is going to have major repercussions, maybe not in the next decades, but it's out there. Um, but I think people who are energy literate understand that you know an energy crisis, certainly an approximate time scale is going to cause way more harm. I mean, just the fact of, you know, fertilizer um, consuming 1% of global primary energy being utterly dependent on natural gas for the foreseeable future, you know, extinction rebellion says 4, 4 billion people are going to die by, you know, 2030, 2040. The prophecy would be fulfilled if we kept it all on the ground, essentially. And I think in terms of my charitable read of why people are not necessarily climate skeptics, but not um, climate alarmists, um, or for taking the kind of drastic actions prescribed by, um, you know, the climate organizations. Um, is, is that, does that ring true for you? Or where do you sit in terms of the climate well, debate? So how, and- how I've dealt with climate change, and I'm not a climate denialist. I, I've read the IPCC reports. I understand them. I appreciate them. I really like the science that the world has done around it. And I think we should limit emissions. And I, I love Mark Nelson's take that I don't know that playing an experiment with our atmosphere is a good technique or, you know, is, is a good idea, um, changing the you know, makeup of our atmosphere. But what I, what has driven me in my life and my career and, you know, why I chose to get educated the way I did and the way that I choose to spend my nights and weekends and my day job is energy is just so good. And the value that it brings to the world is incredible. And if we can bring more energy to more humans, then that immediately betters their lives like overnight. And the cleaner the energy is, the better. But more important than cleaner, and you see this in real life examples globally, uh, the more energy you get out for the energy that you put in, the more usable it is, the higher quality energy, the less entropy created, uh, the better human lives are. And so we see that with oil and gas globally. That's, to me, fundamentally significantly more important than the climate conversation, which is there's still 2 billion people in the world that are living in abject poverty. And a fundamental driver for that is they don't have enough energy. And, you know, there's more people are killed annually from air pollution than from, than how many were killed by COVID. I mean, I, I find that to be still unacceptable and it's still happening. And so how can we fix that? You know, we can convert to natural gas and power plants, but we can also convert to nuclear. Um, and we can bring people more energy faster. So I, I hear the climate conversation, but I, frankly, I think it's a, a big distraction from the bigger problem that is there are humans that are suffering globally now that are in energy poverty. And because we're not helping them and we're not focusing on that problem, we're focusing on reducing emissions instead rather than bringing them more energy, like they're suffering because of that. And that's immoral to me. Meaning, if we're going to chase something, if we're going to solve a problem, like uplift the rest of the world out of poverty with more energy use. So, and if that comes at the expense of increasing emissions, short term or long term, I'm confident, being an engineer and scientist, I'm confident we will invent new technologies that are awesome and can scrub the, scrub the atmosphere and dispose of toxins and make it safe for humans to live. But I mean, man, if you're not getting clean water, if you can't move your family, if you can't get food to your um, home, if you can't heat your home in the winter because you can't afford energy, like, that's terrible. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's my take. And, and so the, I don't disagree with the climate argument. And I, I love that it's gained mainstream acceptance and that it, it you know, people are aware of it. But I, I don't see it as a good solution for especially wind and solar, for <laughs> helping solve uh, from an environmental perspective, like the problem of getting more energy and like making the environment a better place. It just, that doesn't happen. But, you know, from a perspective of, well, let's use it to help the argument to support more nuclear. I, lo- I love that. I'll cherry pick that. But that's because I think nuclear has so much potential from its energy density. So. Well, and there's been all these accidental decarbonizations with nuclear, certainly of electricity. Um, by people who didn't give a hoot about climate or it wasn't on the radar at that point. They wanted to sell their natural gas. Which So this is a hot take, I, and I say this all the time. Like The renewable movement is one of the best things that has ever happened for the natural gas industry. 
<laughs> like just fundamentally you look back at it and it's like, wow, thank you. We really appreciate it. That we're going to sell tons more natural gas because this technology is inferior. And uh, thanks for the free ride, you know, like, and we get to tout the PR that we're decarbonizing or we did more to decarbonize along the way, which is true. But like, it's just baffling to me that, you know, proponents that are truly behind climate change, want to solve climate change, aren't rallying around nuclear full stop to eliminate emissions and still even talk about renewables. So. Right. right, right, You know, I'm pivoting back to nuclear for a second, but, uh, and, and again, we've talked a little bit about what, what constrains it, what holds it back, um, that in your opinion, there's not like a fossil fuel conspiracy. Um, that you know, almost the opposite with renewables. If I doubt there's a conspiracy to you know, <laughs> right, <there is. laughs> secretly supporting the planet. Into that. There is. <laughs> they, yeah, but that's called the environmental uh, movement, right? I mean, f- for me, fundamentally, this is a question. Like, nuclear gets built when there's demand. When you know you're you're going to put in some capital costs and you're going to put some kilowatts out and you're going to be able to sell those kilo- kilowatts. And I don't think I've seen a single example. Um, of that demand being there purely from a climate concern. Certainly there's lots of subsidies, but again, that's an economic concern. Even here in Ontario, I was thinking about it. You know, we made burning coal illegal. That was enabled by nuclear, but we already had the plants. Uh, They'd just been mothballed because we didn't need the electricity. Maybe coal was temporarily cheaper. Maybe there was just a, you know, under- What does that tell you, Chris, about what people really care about? Do they care about climate or do they care about energy? Right. And where are they willing to make the sacrifices? So, I mean, that that's what makes me bear it. Like, frankly, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm hopeful for nuclear, but I'm often quite, you know, pessimistic or bearish in terms of, you know, real world deployments. Um, that demand is not going to be there because of climate change. Realistically, um, it's unlikely to be there in terms of, you know, swap out for fossil fuels voluntarily. Um, like I said, the Ontario example there's a lot of political momentum. But if we get behind it and we, yeah. we make it better and we, we decriminalize it, I love Alex's uh, phrasing of this, Alex Epstein's phrasing, if we decriminalize it and reduce the burden to get there, then we'll innovate, we'll make it cheaper, we'll, we'll build it even better. And I'm kind of a futurist and very optimistic, very bullish on the world and humans. Um, I, I think about everything that we could build and how much value we could bring to the world if we deployed more nuclear. Like, it's just unbelievable it's very exciting and so yeah I, I don't know I, I didn't I don't know what your question was but that's what comes to mind I often don't know what my question is either um, <laughs> let's let's uh, start to wrap it up um, give you a chance to uh, kind of toot your horn about what you're up to uh, fire to fission um, very nice uh, catchy summary of, of your your philosophy but just um, take a couple minutes to to walk us through what it is what your plans are so fire to fission now we've got a small team all volunteer driven we're not Many of us come from the oil and gas sector, um, but we're, we're not financially incentivized at all, but we're acting as an advocacy group for the nuclear industry, um, meaning we want to build more, we want to see more built, and we want to transform how people are thinking about this. Um, and we're, we're doing that right now. So several of us live in Colorado, um, but you know, we've got people helping us kind of all across, all across the country, um, the United States. And... We're, we're launching a podcast to interview experts in the nuclear industry, learn more, have more of these conversations. But really our goal is to expand this thinking around there's huge value in energy dense fuels. So let's chase that and let's make that the conversation and you know, highlight how much good we can bring to the world from that. Um, and you know, a project that we're working on right now in Colorado is transforming the state legislator's opinion about nuclear. Um, so we've got a little advocacy group that is helping us kind of grassroots effort um, because something something strange happened, Chris, on Valentine's this Valentine's Day this year in 2023. Um, there was a bill brought before the state Senate that uh, they wanted to change the definition of clean energy and just add to the state's definition of clean energy nuclear. Like it was adding a couple of words to the bill. Um, very simple decision, right? I mean, people are making this decision globally. Why wouldn't Colorado, with this envir- very environmentally friendly state, right? We've got NREL here. We've got um, CU Boulder, where I went to school, very is you know very well known for being um, pro environment. Um, there was a, it was brought to committee, and there was uh, five Democrats, two Republicans on the committee, and it was voted uh, down five to, five to two. All the Democrats voted against it. Uh, Twelve people testified in favor of it. 
um, including Phil Ward, who's the you know the leader of Americans for Nuclear Energy here in, in Denver, um, and Nuclear Energy Institute, and people called in. There, there were tons of supporters in the room for it, and only two people testified against, and yet it was voted down, and not you know. I, I was baffled. I was floored. And so that's really energized me and you know, made me want to use this platform, Fire Division, and get people behind this to say, how this, this was wrong. Why, why did this happen? So I went and talked to one of the state legislators afterwards, that, uh, the senator that was the chair of the committee, and I asked, well, why was it voted down? What? And she's like, well, I don't know that it's safe. I don't, you know, what about the waste? How do you know it's clean? I don't know it's clean. If I go back to my constituents in Broomfield, then I don't, I don't know that it's going to be clean. I, 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 nobody, and then she said, nobody lobbied us. Nobody got in front of us ahead of time. And so that spoke to me and said, there is a problem in the industry, the nuclear industry, including part of the grassroots effort, that we're not getting in front of people fast enough, far enough, um, or effective and effectively enough to actually affect change. And I think this is happening in New Mexico with the bill that they just passed um, preventing any new nuclear material to bring into the state, which effectively uh, nullifies any value that the whole tech facility has there. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that it's not happening everywhere. And, you know, UK just had an announcement that they, they want to make nuclear uh, part of the green um, or, you know, classified as green. But um, I, I, there's a deficiency, you know, in Colorado in my home right now. And so we're starting at home and trying to, trying to transform that. And there's another bill that's coming up in the House that's going to be voted on on April 6th. Um, and you can call in and testify remotely. Uh, and so if, if, we, if this is released before then, then I hope that everyone does. Uh, and, you know, we can get a lot of voices and get a lot of support for it. Um, but that, that bill is just to study clean energy and, and dispatchable firm energy in the state and advocating the Colorado Energy Office does that. So those are examples of, you know, we're, we're writing legislators. I'm sitting here in a suit jacket. I'm going to go and talk to, go to the state capitol and try and talk to these legislators on the committee that are going to vote on this in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, we're, we're doing emails, phone calls, and then, like I said, we've got the, the podcast that's kind of our public-facing piece. It's not live yet. We, we plan to start publishing episodes in Q2, um, but that is our effort to add to this conversation. And, you know, bring some sobriety and some, some technical expertise, certainly, um, but, you know, perhaps a, a more rigorous view to, to the conversation. Because ultimately, oh, Chris, I mean, a lot of us don't want to work in oil and gas. We want to go build nuclear power plants, or we want to build them and bring them into our oil and gas facilities to make make them even more profitable. You know, so right, right. No, I mean, it's it's uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's also a sad thing because like the number of charitable organizations out there uh, supporting n- the nuclear industry is is pretty stunning. Um, right? Again, <laughs> I'm it, not it, me right? At all. Uh, yeah. So sometimes I look at myself in the mirror and say, "What the hell are you doing with your time?" But <laughs> yeah, we're true believers. Um, there, there's a there's a logical narrative that gets us there. Thank you for explaining yours today. Um, I have a strong inkling we'll be having you back, Mark. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And, yeah, I'd love uh, to. I got a lot to talk about. So. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Okay. 